Okay. So let's start. Thank you very much for your join. Today almost we have uh, 13 participants as of now. Uh, as you can see, it's all over the uh, globe. Uh, I really appreciate for taking this time. Uh, in this difficult time, we want to um, talk about uh, forensic uh, and fraud examination. This is the introduction portion. Uh, my name is Sharif Said. Those who know me, um, uh, I, you know, uh, again, I will just repeat myself. Um, I have uh, more than 25 years experience in uh, accounting and forensic accounting and fraud examination uh, all over the world. I worked in, uh, in America, Middle East, Southeast Asia, um, for Fortune 500 companies. I worked for last time I was with in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia with Abdulatif Jamil, the largest uh, Toyota Lexus dealer in the world. Um, and we have started this uh, company, uh, Synergy Technology, to bring some uh, uh, useful certification program and training. And we also have software solution that we provide. You can go to our website and you can find some detail about the training that we are offering, uh, technology training like software testing, Python programming. Uh, there will be a Python programming training coming uh, sometime uh, next week. That's the introduction to Python. I think that will be very useful, especially those who are in the forensic field. Um, knowing only accounting is no longer enough. You need to have a little bit of knowledge about data analysis. Um, so Python is a good way to start that. Okay, I'm a CPA and a CFE also, and then an MBA, okay? Um, so let's start. Um, what we will do today, before we get into uh, uh, the discussion about uh, fraud examination, I will talk about uh, briefly uh, about certified fraud examination, uh, certified fraud examiner program. Uh, this is one of the most recognized uh, uh, profession in the field of fraud examination, be it uh, regular investigation or e-discovery. Um, and we'll talk about it, uh, how to become one and uh, what are the exam format and so on and so quickly. Um, because a lot of uh, the people that uh, are joining, that's those who are participating in this training, they requested that we talk about it a little bit. And then we'll talk about the, uh, understanding the seriousness of fraud, especially we'll talk about in terms of uh, occupational fraud, and then we'll define fraud and classify fraud and how expensive fraud is for a business. Mm -hmm. And then we'll talk about the activity between what is the criminal or civil laws around the fraud and uh, be familiar with various fraud fighting careers today. Um, I will just tell you that there may be some repetition from the first section and the last section, but uh, that will happen even next three days also because a lot of these uh, topics are overlapping each other. It's difficult to really separate them um, into different sections, okay? Well, that's my picture when I got my CFE. So we'll talk about how you can get your CFE. Um, Association of Certified Fraud Examiner. This is a um, Austin, Texas based organization. It's, uh, it has more than 90,000 professional and growing fraud. They are very well recognized globally now for Hi. their position against fraud fighting. And um, especially their annual publication, the report to the nations, which kind of summarizes global um, impact of fraud in different uh, statistics is one of the most recognized uh, and accepted uh, paper or uh, the research on fraud matter globally. Um, they also publish magazines that will sh that share discusses a lot of the upcoming issues related to fraud. And not to mention that CFE professionals usually make 30% more than their peer without the CFE certification. And uh, ACFE, they also conduct global conferences. Um, in a America, they do it in Las Vegas. It's a massive conference, the largest in the world. They also do it in Canada uh, at different locations. Uh, they do it in Africa, in Europe, 
uh, in Middle East, last few years, it has been happening in Abu Dhabi because Abu Dhabi Accountability Authority, they are, they are sponsoring it. And in Southeast Asia, it happen, usually it happens between Hong Kong and Singapore. Last year, it was in uh, Australia, Sydney, I think. Uh, these conferences are very useful in from source of information about how to fraud, fight fraud, and uh, different technicality related to fraud, okay? Now, typical work of a forensic accountant or fraud examiner relates to FCPA. It's an uh, anti-bribery law from US and UK Bribery Act due diligence. We also do corporate investigations. We also do corporate construction claims. You know, whenever there is a construction, there are a lot of uh, um, overcharges can happen. So usually the fraud examiners are brought in to review the construction um, cost and uh, provide a report. I have worked with some of my colleagues in the past on those projects and we found a serious issue with uh, over, overcharging. Environmental claim, estate and family valuation, uh, fraud investigation, uh, financial contract dispute, government contract claim, merger acquisition due, uh, due diligence, uh, foreign investment due diligence, intellectual property infringement damage, et cetera, et cetera. There are many other areas that you can work. The work usually you can provide, it can be a fraud prevention work, uh, fraud deterrence, fraud detection, fraud investigation, fraud loss and cost recovery. This is particularly useful for the insurance industry. Anti-fraud controls, for anti-fraud education and training, that's another field that is becoming uh, uh, very popular. Are you, can, can you guys see the presentation clearly? Yeah, it's very much clear. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, to be a CFE, a, C, a CFE, they require certain things that you have to be an associate member of ACFE in good standing. That is without becoming an associate member, you cannot sit for the exam. Then you have to have at least a bachelor degree and above, and at least have two years of professional experience in the field of audit and fraud investigation. They are becoming very particular about this area. Um, so when you submit your application, you make sure that you explain your fraud experience. And you need to get three professional recommendation, preferably people you have worked with. They don't usually accept recommendation from uh, anybody. Um, of course, you should not have any uh, ethical or uh, violation. And then they take the CFA examination and uh, agree by the code of ethics of a CFA. Now, this examination the CF examination, it has four different parts. Part one is the financial statement of fraud schemes. Part two is fraud prevention. Part three is fraud investigation. And part four usually uh, related to laws, related to fraud. And it has two segments. You can sit for the US law and regulation, or you can do the international version. Those who are outside US, I suggest take the international version. And those who are in the North America, US version may be more appropriate. Each section has 125 multiple choice questions. And each questions you have one minute, 10 seconds to answer. Total examination will take you, each part will take you 2.5, two and a half hours per part, okay? Once you begin examination on one part, you have to finish it straight to, uh, in two and a half hours. You may take five minutes break, that's max. And, um, but once you sign up for the examination and you meet all the requirements, you have 30 days to finish the exam. That means once you start, for example, on laws on fraud, and you finish that, you have to finish it in two and, two point, two and a half hours. Then for the other three parts, you have 30 more, 30 more days to complete those four parts, remaining three parts. Once you start a examination on a part, you have to finish it straight. It, there cannot be any break. You have three chances to take the exam. 
That means you take the first time exam, you don't meet the 80% uh, correct answer requirement, they will give you two more chances to take those exams within the 30 days. Okay, so they usually, it is not that difficult to pass the exam if you are focused and you study and you prepare for it. A lot of it, especially those who are working related in topics, related to audit and fraud, it will be much easier for them to understand. You have to, um, after the exam in this, if you're from North America, they don't require you to do any other certification. You finish the exam and you sign off and they will send you the result and the certificate if you meet the requirement. If you are outside America, uh, in some instances, I have seen them asking for a separate uh, certification from a person of authority who can certify that you did not cheat the exam. So that you will uh, have to have ready. One of your recommender can be that uh, one who can provide the certification. Any questions? Okay, I'll move, forward, move on. Uh, by the way, if you have any question, you can also type it in. I have Mr. Ashraf who is keeping tack of, tab on the exam and uh, on, your, on your questions so that he can pass it on to me and I'll give you the answer. Okay. I will do my best to answer within the time that we have. Now, what is covered in these four parts of CFE exam? The part on financial fraud scheme, it talks about accounting regulation, financial statement fraud, different auditing techniques to detect fraud and et cetera. So it's all about um, detecting the fraud um, in different types of fraud. In, it includes internet fraud, computer fraud. Um, so that section is very useful for those who work on e-discovery area, computer forensic. Then it has a section on fraud prevention. It talks about different publication from AICPA uh, Institute of Internal Auditors, UN Charter, OECD guideline, and various organizations ad, uh, addressing how to segment of fraud prevention, how to prevent fraud. That's what they uh, talk about. All the re regulation, internal controls, checks and balances that we need to have, uh, due diligences that we need to have to prevent fraud in an organization. And the investigation section talks about the investigation best practices, the behavioral aspect of fraud perpetrator, because we need to understand when it's investigation, you're dealing with human beings. We're not dealing with computers anymore. It will end up in interviewing people. So you need to understand that how your human behavior impacts investigation method. And the law section, as I told you, relates to there is a sex with one section. Um, you have a choice here. You can ask for the US version. In that case, it will talk about various uh, laws of uh, North America, the United States, related to fraud, uh, racketeering, and uh, th those type of issues, and the penalties and the leg legal system. If you select the international version, then it will talk about various UN charter, international guideline and the various uh, types of laws and regulation that is in existing in different parts of the world. Any question? Okay, thank you. Um, typical job of a CFE, you will see, if you do a search on LinkedIn, you'll see CFO, internal auditor, financial analyst, fraud analyst, especially in the banking and the financial institution, they are very, very, uh, um, they're highly sought after. Insurance claim investigator, adjuster, financial controller, human resource manager. You may be wondering why human resource manager? They have nothing to do with accounting. See, fraud examination is not only about accounting. It's about anything that happens in a business. The HR people, they are critical um, gateway, making sure the right kind of people are hired. If you have the right kind of people in an organization, the organization is going to function much better. So we have experience where people have submitted a, a fake document, fake certificate, fake experience certificate. I, ha I have experience where an organization CTO had all the documents submitted uh, were fake. 
So it happens from all level, from ghost employee. So human resource people, they are the one uh, who should be dealing and doing this due diligence. So for training for them also can be a big, big help for an organization. And they are uh, also, like Excuse when the, when somebody is got hired, they have to do some character checking. As well. Yes, document checking, character checking. Uh, believe me, I have seen so many fake documents in my life. Uh, so um, I don't know, you know, what HR, that's, I think the HR requires more training on fraud than anybody else. And what I so think, let what a I bad seen, guy in, yeah, your company is doomed. Yeah, most mostly the people who does fraud, they, they in the previous organizations also they did the same thing. Yes, exactly, exactly. But and the uh, uh, accountant. Isn't so it a different? Yeah, um, isn't it a different issue for the HR personnel to you know for HR audit? Is it the part of HR audit, right? It's not HR audit. HR professionals we are talking about. Yeah. HR professionals, okay. HR managers, they mm -hmm. also should take a CFE go through this exam, they will be benefited from it also. Most companies don't really realize that. IT auditor, they should be IT professional, especially cybersecurity professional. They mm -hmm. should be uh, taking CFE also. I am I, I'm not an official member of CFE, but I know the benefit of CFE. Um, in some of the institutions I've worked, I've introduced CFE professionals there, and mm -hmm. the result has been great. Okay, so from my uh, experience, I know this is a uh, great uh, program, a very useful program, okay? Um, okay, um, career path, charter accounting, CF, CPA firm, they, are, they hire CFE. Nowadays, they specifically mention CPA, CIA, CFE, okay? Telecom companies, uh, forensic consulting services, insurance companies, so the, it's all over the world, government agencies, even US government, they particularly look for CFEs also. Okay. Now we will, uh, we, we are done with the, um, the CFE portion. Now I hope you, I have explained uh, enough about the CFE examination, the requirements and how to get it, right? Okay. We'll for, move forward with our main discussion. We'll talk about nature of fraud today. Okay. How many of you know about Barney Madoff? Barney Madoff was one of the, uh, how do I say it? The, in the scheme of Ponzi scheme, he is the star, okay? He has defrauded people in the name of a hedge fund for over 20 years period. And basically he, total cost came around $65 billion. That's how much money he had stolen from people. Okay, uh, finally he was caught. In fact, his son uh, helped uh, the FBI to uh, get him. And now he's spending the rest of his life in the comfort of uh, maximum security prison in America. Okay, so that's how common it is. And his friends and uh, circle included uh, the the head of New York Stock Exchange, anybody who is somebody in the uh, in uh, uh, North America in the rich people world were his good friends, and then when it was captured, of course, everybody denied that they did not know him. Now, how do we know about how much fraud is occurring? See, in the case of fraud, the most published uh, uh, location is America. That's where the most of the publication and uh, statistics are available. FBI, uh, we have FDIC, it's a Federal Depository Insurance uh, uh, Corporation, uh, IRS. Then we have various researchers at the universities and the institutions and the organizations. Insurance companies is a good source of uh, fraud information because they have to or investigate every claims and they find a lot of fraud and they publish it. And that's a good source of information. And of course the victims. When we become victim, we tell people that this happened to us. And that's also another way we know that fraud is happening. Nowadays, another 
kind of internet fraud is happening is people are hacking into uh, the Zoom discussion and taking over and doing all sorts of stupid things. But that's the life we have to live, live with. Now, question will be how the magnitude perceived to be changing about fraud. What is the size and dollar of fraud happening? Is it difficult to get fraud? All these things are increasing. Fraud is becoming much more complex. The perception is increasing. The size and dollar involved in the fraud is also increasing every year. And with this crisis, after the crisis is over, you will see a lot of things happening also. People will try to take advantage of the government programs you know, by various fraudulent means. And that will come up, uh, I think, in the coming year, that will be number one topic. Um, based on ACFE survey, survey from PwC and various other consulting firms, there's a consensus more or less that an organization loses three to 6% of annual revenue from fraud. Just imagine every about US organization only. Uh, that's where we have better controls. The okay. con countries where we don't have enough controls. Just imagine how much, what is happening there. Yeah. Okay. US, we have rules and regulations. We have controls. We have trained people. Governance, governance is much better. Than governance you. is much better in the best in the world, in fact. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there, the statistics is three to 6% are lost uh, from fraud. Just imagine countries. In fact, in the recently, ACFE is conducting um, surveys by region. For example, they have survey on Africa. It's not co that comprehensive yet, but they have very comprehensive survey on Middle East, in Asia, in Southeast Asia, in Europe, and guess where the highest impact of fraud so far. Just get to take a take one shot. It's Asia. Asia is the highest uh, per incident amount in fraud. Fraud loss per incident is the highest in Asia now. It's obviously controls are not there yet. Okay. Uh, Sharif, can I ask a quick question? In Asia, sure. do they have any list of any particular countries? Yeah, yeah. I, I, can, uh, I, can, I think I have the most recent one. I can share it with you also. Thank okay. you. Uh, no problem. Um, after uh, Mr. Ashtar, take a note. I will have to send that information to type. Okay. Um, yeah, they, nowadays, last two years, I think they have been publishing a uh, very detailed survey on Asia. And it is, it is not good. Okay. Uh, they have it by country also. Um, and, and I'll share it with you later. So impact of fraud. And if we think the fraud does not affect us, oh, it's stolen from insurance company or what is that to us? You know, they are a billion dollar company. They can take it. No, in fact, insurance company, when they lose money, they will increase the premium. So we will all end up paying for it. So fraud is not free. Okay. And even the share prices, because of the cost increase, the share price. Exactly. Will go down. As the cost increases, you know, price will go up and we all end up paying for it. So if anybody thinks the fraud is free, it's not free. It's not. Okay. Somebody is benefiting, somebody is losing. If somebody is benefiting, we are all losing. We are all. Okay, it's a zero sum game. Okay, it's not a win win game. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, another surprising fact about fraud is that loss incurred from fraud reduces a firm's income on a dollar to dollar basis. Okay, so you lose one dollar from fraud, basically, one dollar income from your company is gone. Okay. For every dollar fraud, net income is reduced by $1. So it takes more revenue to recover the loss from fraud. Right? Right. Okay. Here is a definition I have, but this is not a definition really. This is about what is fraud. Okay. Um, fraud is up to the, you know, imagination and creativity of human mind, okay? There is no limit to it. But there are seven aspects of fraud that we will talk about. These seven parts of fraud has to exist. If we call something fraud, these seven things need to exist. 
Number one is representation. Remember, if somebody puts a gun on your head and takes your money, that's not fraud. Okay, because there was no representation there, right? They were very blunt. They said, I want your money. Give me the money. So there has to be representation. About a material point, if somebody takes a quarter from you, you don't care. So it's not material, but somebody takes $10 million from you, from an organization, that's material. So it's also a question of materiality. So there has to be representation and that representation has to be material. And that has to be a false. So it has to be a false representation. Again, what is that? There has to be representation. The representation has to be about a material point and that representation has to be false. If it is true, it's not a fraud. And it has to be intentional. There has to be an element of intent in it. If it is accidental, it's not fraud. Okay? If it is accidental, it's not fraud. It has to be intentional. And so in fraud, we have two sides. One is the victim, another is the perpetrator. Right? So the perpetrator, he is doing the representation of a material point, which is false and he's intentional. As a victim, he has to believe in it. If I do not believe in the representation, which is material and false, and which is made intentionally to me, I don't believe in it. It's not fraud because I did not take any action against it. And then next one comes. I have to act upon it. As a victim, to, to be a victim, I have to believe in it. I have to act upon it. On, and that has to cause some damage to me or the organization. So these are the seven elements of fraud that has to happen. Anything is missing, then it's not going to be fraud. Okay? Now, what fraud is, what is fraud isn't? Fraud is intentional. It is by trickery and deceive, deception to take someone's asset. It's a theft, it's a crime, okay? What fraud is not, is something taken by physical force. As I told you, somebody puts a gun on your head and takes the money, that's not fraud, that's robbery. A mistake or error, if it's accidental, you put the wrong button and it went in, that's not fraud. There is no victim, it's not fraud. Fraud cannot be victimless. Fraud has to have victim. Insignificant and no one is hurt, that is not fraud. And if there is an acceptable justification, then it's not fraud. Now, why are we con so often? There are two elements to it. The trust, we have to trust. Anybody who cons us, that means they got our trust. Second is greed. That is, I, I really believe in the, uh, uh, the representation he's making that I will make a million if I invest $1,000. Okay. There is a saying in English that it's too good to be true, too good to be true. But we always follow, you know, forget it when there really so-called good opportunity comes with zero risk. There's nothing risk-free. So there has to be trust and the greed. These two things work together so that the conmans can uh, con us. Now, we can classify fraud in two ways. One is fraud against an organization and fraud for an organization. Now, what is fraud against an organization? Embezzlement. I take the money from the cashier, Small from the cash. cash, and pocket it. Then I'm committing a fraud against the organization. Now, what is fraud on behalf of an organization? Management fraud. Management fraud. That is when we are making a false representation to the market about how great the company is doing. That's fraud on behalf of the organization. I am an employee of the organization or executive of the organization. I'm making a false representation like Enron did, like WorldCom did. Okay. So there are many ways to classify fraud. This is one way by, by uh, fraud against or fraud uh, for the organization. Now, today's discussion, 
and the discussion in the next couple of days is going to be about occupational fraud. Now, what is occupational fraud? Occupational fraud is the use of one's occupation for personal enrichment through deliberate misuse or misappropriation of employees organization resource and assets. That is, I am using my company's position in the company to defraud the company for my benefit using company assets. Like if I use the company car to move my personal property to the new location, that's the misuse of company assets unless I got the proper permission and disclosure and everything. Okay. Procurement fraud. Excuse me? Uh, procurement fraud. Procurement fraud is another one. Okay, that's a big one. Uh, we'll talk about that later on also, okay? Uh, guys, can I take a break? There's something here I'm not very, somebody must be hacking my computer because there's something coming up that I did not do it. Okay, Let sure. Me stop. Just give me, uh, let me stop the screening and I'll come back again, okay? You want us to dial back in? No, no, no. Stay online. Stay online. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Okay. This is something to do with, okay. Yeah, somebody was hacking into my thing, okay? Okay. okay. So let me try it again, okay? Hello? Um, yeah. Okay, I will share the screen. Okay. Yes, I can see your screen. screen. Okay. No, I Thank you. Yeah, I told you that some people right are now. trying to uh, do some funny thing. I saw that something was happening. Okay, yeah. so I have to disconnect. Um, so this is another thing you need to be aware of. I always say the fraud is not about how much you know, it's about your mindset. The same thing you see, uh, other people will not be able to see. Okay. Um, sure, sure, sorry, so, so, sorry yeah. to cut in. Quick question. I mean, when we actually detect fraud, how, how normally the auditor detect the fraud in general? Is that like a... In, in the statistics, in the statistics that we have, um, most organizations, they rely on the auditors to detect fraud. But in my experience, I have found the internal auditors most of the time got very close to detecting fraud, but then they stopped because they felt that uh, discovering fraud is not their duty. Okay, that has happened to me almost every organization I have worked for. Um, because the IIA guideline on fraud is, um, they're still debating the, what position they should take. So internal auditors, they are not always ready to confront it because fraud fighting is not See, internal audit is different. Internal audit, you disclose your scope, you disclose your timeline, and you go in, and then you do the work. And yeah, but, but whenever you find fraud, yeah. whenever you find fraud, the discussion is very, very um, not friendly. Yes, I can understand it. But then, uh, if that's the case, who going to exclude you know, the fraud issue inside the company then? Usually, in the company, there should be a team detect, uh, 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 <coughs> dedicated for this purpose. In, like in the States, usually it is the, uh, there is a, the, usually it's under the, uh, the, the corporate affairs or legal department, because in uh -huh. America, everything is sitting, you know, dictated mm -hmm. by fraud. Uh, in other companies, I have seen a uh, dedicated fraud department also, like especially in banking sector. Mm -hmm. um, in the, some of the telecom operators I have worked, they created a separate team for fraud detection. So it was not always the, uh, it is under internal audit, but mm -hmm. a, a dedicated team. So there are variation of it. Um, Sometimes it is the CEO, CEO by CF or CEO first office. They, try to create a exclusive team with high power to do this work. So it is still evolving. Uh, there is no best practice. 
Um, so uh, that's that's what it is. But I think the the internal audit in a good position to take it because most of the case I've seen, they were very close to finding it, but then they stopped. Okay. Actually, uh, the fraud the investigation it initiates uh, from the internal audit department. They uh, they send the complaints to the fraud department, or either they or either in many cases there is a whistle blowing process. Through yeah, that's another. We will we, we'll come there also. That's under the fraud prevention. Okay. <clears throat> now, key to. Occupational fraud, okay. It's Kendall's time. That is, you do it by, secretly, you don't do it openly. You violate employees' fiduciary duties. The one who commits violates employees' fiduciary duty. Um, it benefits the employee financially and the cost organization assets, revenue, and reserves. And we have seen multiple times how that happened. Now, another classification occupational fraud we'll talk about, the three classification of occupational fraud. One is asset misappropriation. They, that is taking company's asset and misuse it. Uh, corruption and bribery that we know, especially in procurement fraud, that happens a lot. And fraudulent financial statement. And that's the most dangerous one. This one has wiped out billions from this world uh, of shareholders' money. We'll talk about that also later on in the uh, subsequent sessions. Okay, so various classification of fraud. Fraud classification according to victims. I told you then another way you can do the classification is by victims. Where the victim is a company organization as a victim, that is the employee, employee embezzlement, Vendor fraud, customer fraud, these are, in these cases, the victim is the organization. Shareholders or debt holders fraud as victim, that is management fraud. Financial statement fraud, when that happens, the victim are the shareholders and the debt holders. Unwary individuals as victims, the investment and other consumer fraud. And there are other victims, you know, miscellaneous fraud that we'll talk about, like tax fraud, divorce fraud, and all those things. Now, employee embezzlement. This is the most common one. Stealing money from the company. Okay. Uh, they're indirect and direct. Direct is employee steals company cash, inventory, tools, supplies, assets. The indirect one, employee takes bribe and kickback from the vendor. And it either increases the cost of the product or it reduces the quality of the goods and services that you're supposed to get. The example here is a CVC construction. There are multiple examples available. The CVC construction was in the building industry. They were building new homes and remodeling older homes. Although CVC construction has a large market share, they unfortunately have a hard time making profit. An investigation into the matter revealed that several of CVC employees were using company supplies and equipment to do their own remodeling job. Okay. On the side and pocketing the profit. One employee alone had stolen more than $25,000 worth of company assets. So these type of scenario, um, even one in Singapore once happened about Bang & Olufsen. Their, they were, their employees were stealing equipment and service from the company also. So you will find a lot most prevalent in the world. In Asia, it's very much common whenever there it's is a- It's common everywhere. You give it to a grocery store. Anytime yeah. a grocery store or a restaurant go bankrupt, you know that it is because they could not control the cash. It was stolen. Um, vendor fraud, the two main varieties through vendors alone or vendor with the collusion with the employee, buyers or vendor, okay? Usually results in overcharge of purchased goods, shipment of inferior goods, non-shipment of purchased goods. Now there's a Halliburton is a great example. It was a <laughs> Department of Defense investigation about the 
oil for um, uh, work program that happened in uh, Iraq right after the Gulf War. And Halliburton made uh, billions by doing this type of fraud. Um, I can provide you the link later on. I can go to YouTube if and you can go to YouTube, do a Halliburton fraud and you'll find detailed discussion about it. And the people, very <laughs> courageous people who came forward and disclosed these fraud. They did it at very heavy price against their own personal interest. And the customer fraud. When is that happening? When the customer do not pay for the good, that is shoplifting, get something for nothing. Okay. For example, lately, what they were had doing with iPhone, this group of people, they were buying iPhone from Apple and then, then they're claiming that it's not working. They're shipping uh, fake iPhone to uh, Apple and getting the refund. Okay. Um, and finally they got caught, but it happened for a while because they're doing it in small, small bits. Uh, it did not come under the radar. Finally, it got to the radar. They made a couple of millions of dollars doing that. Um, deceive organization into giving them something they do not, they should not have. Here's the example of Chicago bank. Here, six individual in Chicago, they just walked into a hotel, in the, in the, walk, walked into Chicago bank. They represent themselves for an organization that was a customer of Chicago bank and then convinced the manager to transfer $70 million uh, to their personal account in New Jersey. And then the money went to Switzerland and suddenly everything vanished. They could not trace them anymore. Again, customer fraud is getting something for nothing, not paying for goods and that's purchased, deceiving an organization into providing goods or services one should not have. Uh, in these days on age of uh, Tokopedia, Amazon, Shopee, um, not paying for goods and goods purchase happen. People somehow uh, use fake address and have it delivered there and uh, they don't pay later on. And even even the, the collection people are involved and uh, yeah. uh, the people, uh, the finance people are also involved from there. That the, they don't collect and then they hide it. Uh, they yes. are not timely escalated. Exactly, exactly. I know one cases where almost uh, half a million was uh, uh, stolen and they did not report it. I don't know if they stole it or somebody else because uh, they didn't want to uh, want it investigated anyway. Um, and the management fraud, this is the most damaging one. Every other fraud does not, it takes money from the organization or the individual, but it does not do the as much damage like the financial statement fraud, where the top management really get involved to misstate financial statement. Um, examples, Enron, Worldcom, Sunbeam, there's so many companies are, um, that I, I cannot give enough example of it. Um, Another one is the investment and other consumer fraud. That is, you're selling worthless investment. Um, examples of Ponzi scheme. I hope you know what is Ponzi scheme is. It is uh, devised by in 1920 by a person named Charles Ponzi. He was an Italian swindler and con artist. His focus was he immigrated to US and he was doing a lot of these Ponzi scheme. Well, he has the dubious uh, uh, credit of uh, uh, the, this particular scheme named after, after him. He was promising climb 50% profit within 45 days and 100% profit in 90 days by, discount, by buying discounted postal reply coupon in other countries and redeeming them at face value in the United States as a form of arbitrage. In reality, what he was doing, he was paying earlier investor using the investment of later investor. It's like what is known as the paying 
Paul with Peter. Um, he, at that time, basically swindled close to $20 million from the investor. Barney Madoff I talked about, that's exactly what it is. There's no real investment going on there. He was basically taking money from uh, older investor, from the current investor to pay the older investor. Pyramid scheme. Now pyramid scheme, all kinds of pyramid schemes are not illegal. Only certain type of pyramid schemes are illegal. When the pyramid schemes involve recruiting new people as the basis for uh, the income, those type of schemes are illegal. Telemarketing fraud, we know. People call us about the, we won the, uh, the lottery and they tell us, so oh, by the way, you are uh, uh, you short of credit. We, we in the uh, telecom industry, we know this uh, a lot. Okay, it happens a lot. It happens everywhere. Nigerian letter and major anybody who didn't get it. <coughs> And nowadays, India is taking over the Nigerians, apparently. Okay. Um, identity theft, that's very big in America, in the, especially in the, in the Western countries. It didn't start that big in other countries yet, but it's very big in Western countries. That they will steal my data, uh, get credit cards, deliver to a different address, and um, charge millions of dollars or thousands of dollars, and I will end up my credit getting damaged. Um, so that happens a lot. Uh, advanced fee scam, um, redemption fraud, letter of credit fraud, internet fraud, letter of credit fraud is I think more common in the um, Asian and other countries. Asia, in Asia. the West, we don't use letter of credit that often, but in, the, uh, in Asia, in Africa, letter of credit is more common and uh, we know there are a lot of fake letter of credit that happens. Mm -hmm. And the internet fraud. Here is a Mr. Ponzi, um, his picture. I mean, he did it so well that the whole scheme is named after him. Uh, pyramid scheme, it shows that how the pyramid scheme will never work because after the 13th layer, you will basically exceed the number of people in the world, okay? Um, Again, this is a summary on the different types of uh, classification of fraud, embezzlement, where the perpetrator are the employees and employees are the employer are the victim. In the vendor fraud, the perpetrator are the vendors of an organization and the victim is the organization to which vendors sell goods or services. And the customer fraud, customer, is the perpetrator and the organization which sells to the customer are the fraud, management fraud. I think we discussed it already, it's, it's a repeat. Differentiate between, okay, this is, okay, management fraud and investment fraud. Um, this is for discussion. Usually if we have a classroom setting, we go into discussion like that. Uh, but general rule of thumb, if it is sounds too good to be true, it most likely isn't true. Okay. So please use that rule of thumb. Whenever you hear amazing opportunity, there's nothing called amazing opportunity. Every opportunity has risk. If somebody is giving you 20%, um, uh, you know, a company grows 20% year over year after 10 years, continuous 10 years, you know something is wrong. When you see uh, revenue going up, and the cash flow going down, you know something is wrong. So we have to use our common sense. Um, I think that's all for today. These are usually uh, employee em embezzlement. How is some investment, investment scam, <laughs> selling worthless investment to unsuspecting investor, vendor fraud. Okay. Um, uh, here we'll talk about the criminal and civil response to fraud. Okay, remember one thing, most of the time, um, the criminal charges are not brought against fraud perpetrator because it's very difficult to prove. Um, because in the criminal case, I will differentiate between the, the criminal and civil case. 
the purpose of criminal case is to right a wrong and civil case to obtain a remedy so in the fraud case to get a remedy is better to get your money back rather than try to put this somebody in jail consequence for criminal case is jail or fines in civil case restitution damage payments burden of proof beyond reasonable doubt that's really really difficult to prove a lot of fraud cases and in civil case is preponderance of evidence in criminal case we're talking about mostly in the western country like in america these are the condition apply there are juries there will be 12 jury um in civil case there may be jury um, in the if there are jury that can be less than 12 organization determination by a grand jury that sufficient evidence exists to indict um filing in civil case filing a claim by a plaintiff the one who uh, got damaged victim he should file the claim verdict in criminal case again as i just said is usually uh, not taken this another reason is you have to have unanimous verdict all the jury has to agree to it one person disagrees it will end up in mistrial uh in civil case unanimous verdicts are not required you have to have a majority um that's why it is preferred most of the cases but in some cases like the barney ebers in the worldcom barney madoff in um, uh, uh in the case of uh, uh um madoff fund these are uh so well documented that they were taken to the criminal court um claims only one claim at a time in case of civil case you can have multiple claim uh join they call it class action now what skills are needed to be a fraud fighter number one analytical skill to be able to examine the data for the symptoms of fraud i have experience where year after year internal audit team came reviewed the document and said everything is fine and then when our team went and found the same document to be a forged document and we were able to stop millions of dollars of fraud <coughs> it was a culture to use petty cash to commit fraud and we were able to reduce it to the almost to the negligent level so it's all about analytical uh ability and also the it's a mindset sometime we decided to go not to see fraud when when it's obvious to us communication skills when you interview a witness or suspect you have to understand the person and communicate to him accordingly or when you write a report you have to write the report in a way that is convincing okay uh, because court has to be convinced so you have to have very good communication skill in writing in verbal in both ways and the technology skill the evidence is there yes and the technology skill you cannot nowadays be a fraud fighter without having technical abilities nowadays you have to have some sort of um, uh, technical knowledge like tableau or advanced excel or acl or um, uh, idea or you know there are many tools available now a lot of these tools are for free uh, to give you the technical ability to analyze data yeah that could And, shorten that could shorten the time as well yes. so investigation will or, take a long time Unless exactly in fact in the next few session we will talk about those topic we just uh, mentioned okay okay some skills that is also required some understanding of accounting and business we need to for a fraud fighter we cannot fight fraud or investigate fraud without understanding the business or have some without having some basic understanding of the accounting because they are stealing money to understand how they steal money we need to understand a little bit of accounting little bit of business process okay and what business they are in knowledge of criminal and civil laws every country 
has his own way of dealing with fraud. Like in America, the rules are very strict about how you interview. In Saudi, for example, how you interview and how you write the report is very different. You have to do it in a question and answer method in a written format. So every country has its own way of doing things. We need to be very much familiar with the local laws and regulations before we conduct any investigation. And if you are able to speak and write in a foreign language, it's always helpful. Whatever mother language you have, mother tongue you have, having a second language, be it French, be it English, or uh, Spanish, is always helpful. And a good understanding of human behavior. This is very, very critical. We'll talk about it. I, I have a separate segment. I uh, don't know if we are going to do it. Uh, about, I have a separate segment about psychology of fraud. Okay. Um, I, will, I probably will put the training later on. Okay. Uh, excuse me, somebody is talking. Let me see who is that. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, can you see? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, finally, uh, this is the first segment. We have the similar time, same time tomorrow and day after tomorrow to continue. This is a three part segment, okay? Okay. Um, employer. As I told you, in America, in other countries also, FBI, uh, Postal Inspector, uh, IRS, U.S. Marshal, Inspector General's Office, they employ CFEs. CPA firms, forensic accounting, law firms, they also hire CFEs. Corporation in the internal audit team, internal security team, uh, organization involved in civil cases, lawyers, uh, university and hospital, they are also hiring um, uh, CFEs and they, for expert witness for computer security and also as an instructor. <clears throat> okay, tomorrow our focus will be why people commit fraud. And sure. we will talk about, recognize who commits fraud, understand why people commit fraud, become familiar with fraud triangle, understand how pressure contributes to fraud, and know why opportunities must be present in order for fraud to be committed. Um, that's the end of the session. I hope this uh, one hour was uh, useful for you and informative. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Can I ask something? Time. Thank you very yes, much, sir. Mr. Uh, Sheriff, uh, and thanks uh, all the team members. Hello. Thank uh, you, Sheriff. Uh, yeah, please uh, ask question. If you have a question. Thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, I, I ask one question. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, whether the CFE exam and course is included with the qualitative analysis or quantitative analysis of the uh, risk and fraud, just like stress testing like this? Now, see, CFE exam is about fraud theory, fraud, uh, what are the different types of fraud. So it will give you a foundation in uh, knowledge. And it is about, it's a professional certification, just like any other professional certification, it tests your knowledge, uh, a general knowledge. Okay. Um, for the penetration testing and those things is not part of a certification program. Those are, they have separate certification available. Okay. Different universities, they are providing this okay. type of program. Uh, I have another question. Uh, okay. I have another question. Whether we will get, uh, do we get the materials of our of this session? Just like a, um, a this is a pre session, so I was not planning to share the material. Okay. Oh, oh but okay. The video of it will be available on YouTube. Our YouTube channel. Okay. okay. We will send you the Thank channel you. link. Uh, the recorded version of this discussion will be there. Very bad. A small question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you talked about uh, you. you know the management fraud being the most dangerous to you know organization. Uh, yeah. 
But what is the most prevalent type of fraud nowadays? Um, not nowadays. Usually, revenue uh, recognition fraud is the most common type because it is easy to uh, fix the revenue side. Okay. Um, there are certain. Uh, I have a segment on financial statement fraud. We'll talk in details about that. I think that is next week. No, week after next uh, week, I think. If I could have a follow-up question. Uh, yeah. In uh, in countries in the East uh, and even in the West, like what advantage would someone get if they took the forensic accounting course? Uh, uh, usually, number one, um, when we offer a paid course, those who takes it, we give them a, a certificate also, certificate of uh, completion. So that that will give them it to meet their CPD requirement, continuing professional education requirement, and also an evidence that they have attended this training and got the knowledge related to fraud. Um, Thank you. A lot of the contents that we have is designed around the CFE content, not all of it. Um, so that will help them if anybody wants to go for the CFE exam, um, they can uh, buy the CFE uh, exam module. This then they will be able to understand the topic they will be tested there. Okay, uh, Shoaib Bhai, uh, Bodrul Millat asked one question. Sure. Uh, fees, fees of CFE. Okay, CFE exam fee is um, the ACFE they charge. $500, no, $400 nowadays for the exam. Um, and also um, anybody, depending on the country, they have reduced the uh, fee for associate. It varies from $60 to $125 per year. Um, that's the basic uh, charges from ACFE that you have to pay ACFE directly. Okay, another question is exam venue in Bangladesh? Do have uh, the exam is online exam. There's no venue required. You have to, you can take it from your uh, home, from your computer. You have to have a functioning computer, internet okay. connection, and um, meet all the requirements of ACFE, and you should be able to take the exam. Okay, what, what, is the pay? what is the pass rate? Um, uh, they don't disclose that information, but in my opinion, it is not rocket science. Um, it's more commonsensical and it's a matter of practice and study. Um, usually in our classroom practice, we share the material. The material is good enough for the, uh, the, to understand the topics. And then also you have to do the uh, practice, and, uh, practice session. If you are, uh, you can talk to Mr. Ashraf about uh, those programs. Okay. Hello. Hello. CFE yes. exam is fully MCQ based. hundred percent MCQ. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. But, what, what, what is the future in Bangladesh? Bangladesh also now there, as I said, an accounting and audit profession. If you have CFE, uh, you should be recognized right away. The new recognition is coming there. Um, we are also doing a lot of campaigning, especially in the financial sector, telecom sector. They are already aware of it. So when you apply for a job with telecom industry or the financial sector, and if this is, you have the CFE uh, completed, you have a better chance in the interview process. And the rest is on you. This is a profession. You have to develop your profession. What about the course material of this CFE course, CFE exam? Uh, once you subscribe to the ACFE um, uh, membership, you should be able to get their manual, which is about 1200 page. Um, you can also download their multiple choice, their exam module, which is about, they cost about close to $800. It has most of the questions uh, that you, the similar questions will be coming in the exam. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? It is not a rocket science. Um, it is a very, as I said, most of fraud is fighting is about mindset. If you have, once you study the material and uh, you should be able to change your mindset. A lot of the questions are intuitive questions. So if you have the right mindset, you should be able to answer most of the questions.
Mm. What is the main or hello uh, side side? Yeah. Yeah. What is the main objective of your you know this course, this online free course based on this part? Huh? Uh, oh no, we are doing this. This one we are just doing for this COVID uh, issue. Uh, yeah. We're doing it as a, a CSR, mm. corporate social responsibility, okay. um, to uh, keep people engaged and okay. uh, you know to kill so the kind of them. Okay. Yeah, but we do offer this on a, as a professional paid service, as okay. a comprehensive uh, package that you can talk to Mr. Ashraf and he will he will be able to share with you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank so you. So hopefully I'll see you tomorrow again. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, sure. And, uh, sure. and uh, sure. look forward to see you tomorrow. Yeah, again, see you. Uh, I will try to upload this material on the. Yeah. Well, 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 one more question. There, there are sure. the list of participants is showing 14 people. There is one iPhone is also coming. 13 yeah. and uh, what is the name of that person? I don't. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so maybe, maybe, maybe that, that is a hacker. <laughs> it could be. Anyway, it okay. was very informative and. Uh, Thank you. Uh, nice I mean, how to the same thing was happening in May. Same yes. question was happening in May. What is iPhone set for? Okay. Anyway, thank you, you sir. Can, you can technically you can access this through if you have the app downloaded on your iPhone. Yeah, no, I'm actually connected uh, via iPhone. Yes, exactly. That's me. Oh, okay, Thai, it's you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, hello. Hi. I'm suspecting everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I actually too advanced. <laughs> okay then. See you tomorrow. Okay? Thank you, Sharif. Bye bye. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you, Mr. Sharif. Thank, Thank you. Bye bye. Take care.